Hello to you friends. This is Stammer on air number five. There's seven questions, but first uh, normal intro. Namo. Tasso. Bhagavato. Arahato. Samma Sambuddhasa. Worthy. Honorable. And perfectly self enlightened. Is a blessed book. Er værdig. Fuldstændig komplet. Og perfekt. Sæt og blyst. Er den vedsignet Buddha. The first question uh, goes, and I thank you for all of those who sent in questions. Uh, they are very good, actually. Uh, all of them. Uh, so I'm very grateful for that. The first question is, Where is the knowledge of past lives stored in a being? How to see these past lives? And these past lives memories, uh, does it first come when the fruit of the tree ripens? What's the question? And uh, since this doesn't, there's not much in the text, in the Tibetaka texts, about this issue, The only thing it says actually is that it's stored in something called Hadaya Vattu. But the scholastic a disagreement what Hadaya Vattu actually means. Vattu means element and uh, or base or source. Uh, and Hadaya means heart. So it's a heart element, but doesn't say where it sits. Uh, whether it sits in the brain or in the heart or somewhere else in the body it doesn't say the text doesn't say so uh, I'll try to answer the question from a a model that I've been working on for some years uh, that I call the barbecue model the BQC, BQC model the Buddhist quantum cosmology model that incorporates all information and is consistent with all what I call experimental data Uh, so first, uh, we'll can s- try to kind of like cover the subject of the so-called engram in modern neurology, contemporary brain science. What does it say? Where is the information stored? Uh, is there some material, molecular basis that we can find for the phenomena of remembrance? And the short answer is actually no. Uh, Nobody knows where the information is stored. Uh, in a neural network I, I worked with intensively myself, in artificial neural networks you simulate in a computer, is stored not inside the, the neuron, the nerve cells, but as weightings of the signals between the, ner- the nerve cells. And that's almost impossible to track uh, in the brain what weightings it does. So you have a nerve cell Uh, it has a lot of dendrites, so it, uh, actually 10,000 inputs, different inputs, and only one output. So it weights, summarizes all the 10,000 inputs, and then decides whether it should send one signal out or not. And this weighting is, we know it ha- it's, it's stored, it's something down in the axon hillock, where the axon goes out of the neural, neural cells. But what actually weightings are done It's a tricky issue with, with, with uh, also time dependent uh, regarding membrane instability uh, for certain uh, ions to flux over this uh, cellular membrane. So it's not something that uh, is easily accessible for experimental probing. Then there's some, uh, some you can say, what about neurology in general, scannings and so on? Yes, if you get a brain damage, that's also been known for many years, also before the scannings. If you get a brain damage in a particular space, uh, then you lose memories of particular things. And also, vice versa, if you uh, take and cut around here and take the lid off uh, on uh, patients that are conscious uh, but uh, have got local anesthetics, then they can, and you put in electrodes, Uh, and uh, pulse some small currents, then they can remember specific things. So it seems that 
it seems from this point of view that the memory is localized to certain places in the brain. Then there is another issue that goes against this, and this is to say, let's say you get a brain damage here, then you cannot remember what time it is. You can see the, the clock on the wall or the watch on the wrist, but you don't know how to interpret that as what the time is. This happens very often for, for patients who get a stroke. Then one has, and also you can, if you get another, you cannot speak and so on, aphasia. And there's other brain damages that give specific defects. However, all these defects are time dependent. So it means that maybe you, one, a, a person who had a stroke in that area where they remember what the time is, then after usually two weeks, three weeks, then they can remember it again without relearning it. They don't relearn it. So it means that the information that was somehow localized in a certain part of the brain is regenerated from somewhere else, apparently. Because if you look at the, this area in the scannings, then it's dead. It doesn't come alive, back alive. But the information it contained or was co-localized with comes back uh, to the patient. Uh, and then it has been kind of like argued that the information is holographically uh, localized on the surface, on the entire surface of the brain. Holographically localization means that uh, the detail is to be found everywhere in a picture. For example, uh, the tip of my finger here, if this was a hologram, then the tip of my finger would be over the, be stored in the entire surface of the frame. Wherever you looked in a certain angle, you, you could be able to see the finger, not at the same time. But the information was there because it is scanned under certain circumstances, be seen being present in any place of uh, the surface, the, the, the image surface. So it's a very interesting philosophical uh, point, holographic orientation, where the detail of the, the whole is folded into the detail. So this means that everywhere, on, in every detail of, this, of the image surface, you can regenerate the entire picture. This was immediately the thought uh, when one has this experiment where, where uh, there seems to be a backup copy, and it does. You cannot say anything about the, where this back, backup copy is, so it was natural to assume that the it was uh, the information was distributed over the entire brain. Then what about past lives? You don't have the same brain. How can that be explained? Yeah. Then, then we have to go in to see what is consciousness. Uh, and there, this is my personal view, it has nothing to do with what Buddhists say because he didn't say anything about it. Uh, but I think it's something elemental. It's a, basically a wave phenomena, just like e electromagnetic radiation. And uh, it has a specific frequency. And you have one frequency, I have another frequency. And this means that uh, this is not something that is in particular, it has non local aspects. Like all other wave phenomena, they're basically fields, like electrostatic fields or magnetic fields or fields of gravity. They are not present only one place, they are, they are present over a large area of space. So uh, this means that consciousness is not only inside the brain, it is basically everywhere. And it f fits with the concept of non locality in or entanglement in uh, modern quantum mechanics, a, a discipline of physics which has recently proven beyond any doubt that if you make some changes here, then some changes happen. An observation here, some changes happen instantaneously somewhere else in space. And that, that without there going any signals uh, between the two places, there can be 1.4 kilometers was two diamonds in this case, 
uh, there have been up to 300 kilometers, but we have reason to believe that however far you take these two uh, elements away from each other, if you do something with the other one, they are, you can register it in, the, in this one. So this is a very interesting uh, concept because this in, in principle should go for all quanta of energy. And consciousness is also quanta of energy because it contains information and because information is an equivalent of energy, just like mass. So this goes that uh, then information could, in principle, be stored everywhere in space. So uh, this redefines brain as more like an antenna, or I would say a transceiver. A transceiver is something that can receive, uh, in this case, uh, electromagnetic radiation, radio waves, and send out radio waves. So it receives and sends out. That is a, a not. This is a transceiver. So mind or the brain may work in similar, in a similar way. So it processes information that is coming, or is is everywhere present. Uh, you can say holographically uh, stored in the entire universe, actually. So it's more like the information is present as standing waves. If we see it from, from a quantum mechanical point of view, that if you observe something, then there's something called collapse of the wave function. Then the wave function is uh, regenerated for each observation. So quantum mechanics doesn't say that there is anything out there before you observe it. What there is out there before you observe it is a uh, distribution of probabilities then, right at the moment it is observed, the particle-like aspect of these probabilities come into play, and then you've got, you got a photon or a proton or whatever nuclear element you can think of. And right after, again, it's basically gone. So this means that past events, any kind of past events, you remembering something, you seeing something, uh, something falling down on Mars, uh, a particle, a photon leaving the, the sun or some other galaxy, that there is an in advance is a probability distribution for that before it happens. Right after it happens, there's also a collapsed wave function where only one, one particular event out of the all the possible ones stands back with the probability of one. This will be, still be a standing wave. This entails that all information of the past has been stored in the universe, non-locally, holographically, everywhere present. So this can then be received or read out if you're on the right channel, right face, is tuning the mind like just like you're tuning an antenna when you tune the radio is tuning the mind to the right frequency then it will sample this information and know what has happened in in a past time both regarding physical things and mental things so this means uh, you can say it's stored in the cloud if we should use a computer a computer analogy a computer has a hard disk, maybe has more than one hard disk. It also has some uh, rapid access memory, RAM memory. Huh? So this is one memory source. Then it has hard disk, long-term memory source. We could call the RAM is short-term memory. This is also known in neurology. You see something that has short-term memory, then it's transferred to long-term memory afterwards. So it corresponds to the RAM memory in your computer and uh, the hard disk. And then there is, the computer can have a backup uh, in the cloud on another hard disk in, a, in, an, in another place, usually called in the cloud. Same thing with this guy. Has a rapid access memory. It's localized somewhere in the brain, but it, it quickly transforms or delivers the information to some other parts in the brain.
the hard disk. But still, there's input and output coming out into the, of the antenna function of the mind, which is probably the antenna. If I should say something, I don't know it. But if I should say something, then it's something called the microtopoli. It's some very, very thin, very strange network of very long structures uh, that is usually found, and they are much more abundant in, ner in nerve cells, but can be found in all live cells, right under the cellular membrane. The argument in my youth as a doctor was that it was something mechanical that was kind of like keeping the cell membrane, which is semi-fluid, out as a tent. But uh, more have been known to other about today, but still it's, it's kind of like assumption. What are this huge, huge network of small pipes, microtubuli means small pipe, very, very thin, nanometer thin. What are they doing? And my guess is, right out of the box, it's an antenna. But I don't know. So nevertheless, it means that, that the, the, the brain could be a transceiver that sends out information and receives information from everywhere. And it's that we are going around in a field of information. And that's why you can remember prior lives. The Buddha then he can see not only on his own frequency, sample on his own frequency, but he can sample on more than one frequency. Basically, he has a free choice of frequency just like you have a free choice of tuning your radio. So he has a free choice of tuning his frequency. And this means that he can sample information that are stored at other frequencies, other kilohertz numbers or megahertz numbers, that you can. But basically, anyone who becomes enlightened, and this also goes for you, and it, because all beings become enlightened at, at a particular time, then they typically remember 400,000 lives in, uh, in, let's say, four hours. It's usually the first that happens on the night of enlightenment. So uh, this that they remember is not information that is stored in the brain they have in the life. They are, be they are being enlightened because this is not the, obviously not the same brain. So where is it stored? It's stored out in space. And there you can sample it. You can, so to so, so speak, resample it from the cloud. So, again, there's three S places where the information is stored. In the short-term memory, the RAM-like memory in the, in the brain, that's local. In the hard disk areas in the brain, that's also local. And then it's stored everywhere in space that's non-local and the non-local information is the basis of remembering uh, past lives very bad light here i just put on a little more light uh, yes that was a little better Anyway, so when it does it ripen, when does it remember? Yet yeah, when there's all the distractions is uh, taken out of the, the the brain or the mind, then it's it's ripened. So it's not a, so as matter of the, the information cannot be perceived now. It can be perceived now, but there's so much noise. So the signal to noise radio ratio. There's more signal than the. the there's more noise than the signal, and therefore you cannot kind of like see it coming out of the sample information, because there's so much white white noise, then you cannot hear the information or see or perceive it. How then also one ask how to see past lives? It's actually not a specific uh, Buddhist feature. It's uh, you, there's also Hindus who can remember uh, past lives. And the, the classic explanation is that one remembers, start training the mind by remembering uh, what happened yesterday. Uh, from, from day, from, in every minute, really. And that's even, that's fairly difficult. And then uh, the day before that, and the day before that, until you come back to your childhood. And then you 
keep on track backtracking and uh, so just by doing that is of course taking a, 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 a significant amount of meditation to do because usually not something you can do while walking around but you can do it on the pillow it's very effective uh, so you you direct the mind uh, the attention deliberately towards a given time point and then you will see with some noise still present uh, but diminishing over time what happened at that particular moment this should just one just keeps doing I hope this uh, covers uh, question one question two is uh, what is the best way to help an elderly person who has no immediate family and is ter terrified of dying alone? Yeah, first, we we'll say with elderly people, they, they can be like children, can be very stubborn, so it can be difficult. And there one should use patience. Patience is the highest practice. Kanti, pardon me, as the Buddhists say. Uh, and then also one should know that they are like children in some instances and can be very stubborn. And, and so one should shut, should not necessarily uh, be able to solve all their problems because this is impossible for stubborn children. And they also have very strong habits because they are at the end of their life, their habituation goes up over your lifetime. So they, their habituation, their, the degree of ingrown habits are very large. So usually they won't accept any kind of change. But nevertheless they have to. And I know this person who asked the question is, is uh, the person, uh, the elderly person don't want to go to elderly care home because the other elders are, are old, basically. Uh, but uh, that's not an excuse. If you cannot stay, either you stay in your own home or you go to an elderly care home. That's a choice. And this person, it's this elderly person has this, one must respect this choice, whether the person end up by dying alone in his, their own excrement in their home, or they go to elderly care home, that's their choice. This, this choice is of course comically determined uh, and conditioned. So uh, everybody kind of like ripens their own sowing and their own seed. And when this person, I hear this person is afraid of dying, then immediately I think, ah, but the, why is this person afraid of dying? Uh, a pure person is not afraid of dying. So there's been some conflicts and some uh, transgressions, uh, a moral transgression in this person's life. And now it's coming, now it's coming up and mind starts being waggy, waggy, waggy. And this I've seen something many times on the hospital uh, with with patients who are dying, that uh, around three weeks before this, is, it starts to be wacky wacky, and one week before it starts, the, one can see the panic in their eyes. In the case of again of a person who has done significantly evil in his in his or her life, and in the moments, in hours to minutes before death, then they are in full panic. So this is not something that you or I or any doctor or any person can console or repair at that particular time. Because it's far, 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 far too late. The, 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 the comic accumulation and thereby conditioning of their mental state approaching death has been conditioned often many years ago. And they cannot remember it and they cannot, will deny anything wrongdoing and so on, but nevertheless they are conditioned to meet death in panic, basically, and fear, metaphysical fear. And so be it. There's nothing much you can do about it. One can give them some medicine uh, from a, a, a doctor has to do that, and that can tranquilize them, uh, but uh, that's more or less it. But, of course, one should go to all the people, but in particular, of course, elderly dying patient with a kind heart and do the best one can for for this particular being. Uh, but one should not expect that one can solve all their problems because that, that's not realistic. I hope they solve this issue. Uh, the question three is, uh, how does anger arise? 
And how does it cease? How, how can we be liberated from anger? Anger arises typically uh, from uh, three situations. is that one sees some situation or person coming up that uh, one thinks ah, it will damage me or it will damage my friends or somebody I like. Or once it, it has already happened, ah, this person or this situation, this circumstance, this organization uh, has already damaged me or hurt me or those I like. Or one suspects that in the future this person, situation, uh, circumstance or organization group will damage me or somebody I like. Then anger arise, opposition. The way to cure it is to use universal friendliness to say basically may all beings be happy. May those I now suspect inside my head or I already have defined as enemies, may they also be happy. Then this uh, aversion fizzles out. It cannot be there because anger and universal friendliness, they cannot coexist in the mind. So if, if, ang if universal friendliness arises, then anger goes away. And vice versa. If anger arises, then universal friendliness goes away. So it's just to remember, I, I had to put up this universal friendliness, then the anger evaporated. It's called metta. Metta. So one do, does metta meditation, which conditions one's own mind to regenerate this aspect of universal, infinite friendliness, kindness, gentleness, loving kindness is also called, towards all beings, and in particular to those who are opposed towards you, whether it's a paranoia, whether you think they are opposed towards you, or whether there's some real evidence out in uh, the so-called reality that this is a case. So one uses the same aspect of universal friendliness towards him. And then one will see that they, their, their anger also kind of like goes away immediately. If you, if you stop adding to it by being opposed. So again, it's, it's a sign of the non-locality of mind, of consciousness, that the consciousness, remember that uh, one's own consciousness is not only inside one's head or brain. It is also inside the brain, head and brain of the opposing person, the enemy. And there it's also conditioning due to the interference phenomena of all waves at, at all frequencies. Due to this interference phenomena, they can uh, feel it. We call it the intuition. They can intuitively feel you. However, not very conscious it's kind of like subconscious or semi-conscious that all beings feel each other wherever they are in the universe. But to uh, the amplitude or the d strength they feel it with or register can be very variable. It can be one billion, then you can read the minds of others. Then it can be uh, 0 0.02. Then there is still the information there, but uh, it's very, very weak and uh, imperceptible but still is there. So it's just a matter of degree, of the amplitude of the inf interference, basically. So two waves are meeting, and what when they meet, in the point they meet, what wave would be the resultant wave? How high would it be? That's where the information is. is, is the strength of the information, the intensity of the information can be read. And thereby also, for example, is this other being friendly towards me or or is this other being uh, hostile towards me? This can be read out in this non-local information, field of information. Uh, so, again, the cure is metta. Very nice thing. It's a Brahma Vihara. It's a divine dwelling. It's infinite. It blazes from the heart. Uh, how does sadness arise? How can we heal from sadness and being hurt? Is uh, 
Sadness arises basically from expectation, which is a derivative of desire for certain things to happen in the, in the future, and thereby also a, a desire for certain things or aversion against a lot of other things, all alternatives for, hap- for, the, for those alternatives happening in the future. So as soon as there's expectation, there will be frustration because usually the future doesn't fall out exactly as the expectation uh, says. And then sadness comes up. Why is it not uh, as I want it to be? Why is it not as I dream it to be? Then sadness arises. How to heal it? it, it uh, kind of like wipe out this expectation. How? And one says constantly one's self ah, is good to have dispassion, uh, disgust regarding this world, being dissatisfied with the world, with the entire world, not only this world, any kind of other world also, with the existence as a whole. One say, ah, I'm dissatisfied with this. And so that that's a basic uh, circumstance with all existence. Thereby the expectation goes down. One stop expecting anything. Because it's really bad out there anyway. In the first place. So uh, there's no need to expect any kind of like a pink dream uh, about any kind of future. So you can say you have a, a big balloon here of dreamed up future. And then you take uh, the needle by this practice, poof. The pink dreams, they are gone, they, and they don't return. Again, it's something you can do by degree. You do it a lot, you don't expect anything to happen. It's okay whatever comes, and also whatever goes. Because so is it. You knew that in advance. What is karma? is question five, and how can we fu- purify karma? Yes, uh, karma is of three things. Basically, first of all, it's an activity that arises in the brain as intention, chetana in Bali, intention. It's the intention that is a derivative of consciousness, embedded in a consciousness, that has this probability effect on the future. It is not the actual doing of it, the performing of this intention. It is the intention itself. So the intention counts, comically speaking. Before you do anything, before you think anything, there's an intention. Before you say anything, before you do anything with the body, there's intention. So we say the karma comes out of, of three doors. There's manu karma, is you're thinking about something. I want to do this and that and that. I want to kill this person tomorrow, or I want to give a present to that person tomorrow. So there's two different uh, forms of karma, one bad, one good. Uh, then it can come out as, it's called manu karma, manu mind karma. Uh, then there's speech, karma coming out of, through speech, either out through the mouth or through the internal speech that you are speaking to yourself with. It's called vachi karma, speech karma. Then there's body, kaya karma. It's coming out in out through the body, you're doing something. Having intended it first, and said to, it, to yourself first that you want to do it, then you do it. So it's coming out of the three doors. This is good to remember. It's coming out of the three doors. Either it comes out the mind door, it comes out the speech door, or it comes out the body door. And this is three doors that should be guarded, not letting anything evil out of these three doors. Because this evil is accumulated in everywhere in space as a standing wave of probabilities that will make you suffer later on, that increase the, the, the probability for a lack of success on any kind of plane, in any kind of doing, and also increase the probability of feeling painful feeling in a given situation or observation. Frustrated feeling, or physically painful feeling. 
How do we uh, purify karma? Yes, there's basically uh, three situations. There's, we call it the ten causes of action, the ten sources of karma. Uh, three bodily actions is killing, stealing, and uh, illegitimate sexual intercourse, a sexual abuse. There's four verbal actions, lying, slandering, aggressive speech, and empty foolish babble. And there's three mental actions. Covetousness, desire you want something, or you're envious about something that somebody who has it, ill will and evil views, wrong views. So, is purification of this karma then is avoidance of all killing, avoidance of all stealing, avoidance of all sexual abuse. It is avoidance of all lying, avoidance of all rude speech, avoidance of all slandering divisive speech and avoidance of all empty foolish babble. And then is right views, unselfishness and goodwill. So this is with the way to purify karma. It's remembering there is this karma part, the cause of action and there are ten kinds. Basically they are embedded in the five precepts. If one keeps the five precepts, or the eight precepts, or the ten precepts, or as monk does the two hundred seven, twenty-seven, then one is purifying the karma, because one avoids doing what is evil karma, and thereby one doesn't accumulate any bad effect uh, of it. In the ultimate sense, for the arahat. And they stop doing. Do they stop doing? They stop karma. They end karma. It's the ending of karma. How do they do that? They don't intend anything. They can walk around in the world and eat and so on, but they have no preferences whatsoever. They don't. They don't have any kind of like or dislike. And because they don't have any kind of like or dislike, they don't form intentions. They're not attracted towards anything. They're not repulsed with anything. They, they kind of like completely neutral regarding all events. And therefore they don't, they don't accumulate karma. They don't form karma and therefore don't accumulate karma. That's why you, they don't, when they are at the moment of death, then they exhausted their karmic accumulation that they had from the past and then since they become enlightened in this life, then they don't, from that point on, they don't accumulate any further karma. This means that their karmic accumulation goes in zero. And is zero at the point, of the very time point of death, the duty moment, the death moment. There is no probabilities out there or in here or anywhere for anything, for their particular individuality, their process. So it ends there, cut. It ends right there. That's Nibbana for them because they, they do not come back here. They are not reborn because the probabilities, the karmic accumulation is zero, pure zero, simply. I hope this cover uh, this issue. We can take it up in, in, uh, in more depth. Uh, I put uh, three uh, called Karma Mechanics, three speeches on my SoundCloud uh, profile. You can search it. Karma Mechanics, I, I should, I call it uh, Karma with a Q. Karma, q -arma Mechanics. To make some uh, analogy there with quantum mechanics. Because basically it is the same. And they are, they are covering the aspect of karma in, in great detail and I can recommend uh, hearing them. What is telepathy? is then question six and how does it work? Uh, telepathy in it means that you can read the minds of others or 
maybe even affect the minds of others from a distance. And again, one has to remember that uh, two consciousnesses, let's say we're 10 kilometers apart, or two persons with two brains, 10 kilometers apart, does not have only the consciousness here or there. Their consciousness, if we take one person here, then the consciousness will have a high amplitude, has a high intensity, just like a radio wave. And then the intensity of the, uh, of the consciousness goes out in space, but it goes down uh, asymptotically. So it never really, re principally, never reached zero, even at long distances. So this means that in any kind of space, is there an overlap of not only one, but many consciousness, in fact. Uh, however, since this, this consciousness has a frequency, and it's a specific frequency, then they need not interact very much. But if waves of, 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 uh, of fields of, of uh, different frequencies are meeting, then there will always be some kind of interference. And this is basically the, the base, this interference phenomena uh, of, of waves meeting other waves. In this case, waves that are made out, of, made out of consciousness and probability at the same time because it's a two-way system. Just like a magnetism induces a electricity and electricity, vice versa, induces the magnetic field. This principle is called induction. Then also probability induces Consciousness and consciousness, vice versa, induces probability. So they are more like magnetism is one side of the same coin as electric potential, and consciousness is the same is one side of the same coin as probability for something to happen, for an observation to occur, for you to have an experience, for you to have a feeling of this or that. This is everywhere present, it is, it is in principle computable uh, by the Schrodinger equations, but in practice this cannot be done for more particles than two or three in certain situations. So it cannot be computed in practice, but it should be in, in principle. So please, the last question is actually the most interesting from a Buddhist point of view. Please explain the rarity of human birth and the rarity of a Buddha. We take first uh, the rarity of a human, being born human. And they once asked the, the, the Buddha about it. And he's, he gave, what is the chance of, if you've been born as an animal or lower, how, what is the chance of becoming human again, coming back to the human state? And then he said it was very, very slim chance. Uh, but say, when was, sir, can you give an, an analogy? A simile. Yes, he said, I can. And then he gave a very famous simile called the simile of the blind sea turtle. He said, if you take a round yolk uh, and throw out a wooden piece uh, that is round with a hole in the middle and throw it out on, on the seven oceans and it's drifting around in 100 years, everywhere, whatever it goes, it never, it's not, it's not uh, f sh thrown up on the shore stays floating around somewhere in the oceans. Then you have a blind sea turtle, and it dives only up and take a breath every hundred year, and cannot see anything, because it's blind. The chance of coming back from a lower state of being to human being is the same chance as the sea turtle diving out and then diving right up with the head inside the wooden yoke. There is a probability, but because the oceans are very large, and because so, it's, and because the sea turtle is swimming around and is blind, the, the chance is very, very slim. But it's not zero, but it's very, very slim. So being born now is, a, is we call it a fortunate situation because you have the chance to modify your own karma in a, a whole other sense that the animals who are driven 
and by instincts that they have. So you should utilize this chance now, 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 and then purify the karma by taking the five precepts. I just say last uh, this Christmas was a poor day where one usually take the, the the precepts. There was one person uh, that took the precepts at my website. Uh, one person, it was a person from Lebanon. I'm happy about it. But it's uh, strange to think that uh, there's only one person. I sent this email out to 8,000, but there's only one person who take the precepts. It's one out of 8,000. That always gives us an idea that uh, humanity, seen from a Buddhist point of view, is pretty bad off because people don't care about what they do. People don't care about their karma. People don't care about their future. They are all nihilists. They think nothing happens at the moment of death. Well, they will have a nasty surprise in most cases. And I mean nasty. Another another way of getting a kind of like handle on how it is is to say, uh, if we can, can we estimate from how many humans there are on planet Earth and how many animals there are, for example. Yes, you can, there's seven billion people, huh? Uh, I don't know how many animals there are, but if you count the number of insects and shri shrinks, small uh, crustaceans in the ocean, then they are, I would say, maybe a billion or a billion, billion times more. So, of course, they have a shorter lifetime, but that actually only makes the, the, the matter worse. So you can see, uh, it must be that there are very few of those uh, billions of billions of insects down here, a huge mass of beings, individual beings, that are actually diving up and becoming a human. Because uh, if more of them were diving up and becoming human, then we will have more human than seven billions. And we don't have, we have seven billion. And it's not going up and down uh, very much. Then the rarity of a Buddha. The rarity of a Buddha is extreme. They are the most rare beings that, that are in the universe. Sometimes they can pass uh, 60 universes, 60 Big Bang to Big Crunch, without even one Buddha coming. Then the humans and also the devas on high levels, they act as animals. They are as primitive as animals. Constant war, constant conflict, uh, always uh, cannibalism among human beings, always uh, pedophilia among human beings. So it's uh, kind of like a horror show when there's no Buddha to say what is right and wrong in the ultimate sense. It, it comes, why is it so? It comes with the, th the fact that uh, how to how does a Buddha become Buddha and actually in the first place? And the Buddha, there's ten conditions. Uh, they have to uh, give this promise that they will become Buddha to another Buddha. This has has to happen, uh, and for this uh, promise to the Bodhisattva woe, you say we call it, huh? Uh, for this promise to be effective. Then they have to be, at the time they are giving the, the promise, the Bodhisattva woe, they're taking this woe, they have to be a human being, a male, that should be, that should be sufficiently developed to actually be enlightened in this particular life. They should be a recluse at the time of the declaration. They are withdrawn back out of uh, the bus of normal life. Uh, they meet a, should meet another Buddha and declare it for them. They should uh, be able to uh, meditate on a fairly high level all the fourth jhanas and ha have all the superpowers uh, connected with the fourth jhana, like diving in and out of the, uh, the earth, uh, elevating and flying around in, the, in, in space and so on. They should be pre prepared to sacrifice their own life for the sake of others. And they should be firm uh, and unwavering in their decision. And it goes without saying how many of, of such beings are there. Very few, very, 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 very few, even when there are Buddha present. But they should be present and that 
then they 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 should then give him a promise meet him and uh, give this promise then later on then he will make the prediction he will look into the future and say ah uh, there's a whole series he will say you will be a, a buddha at that particular time you will be a buddha in how many eons so and so many universal cycles you will be a buddha you'll have this and that name your mother and father will have this and that name your horse will have this and that name your prime disciples will have this and that name your three castles will have this and that name and so on there's a whole standard series that is of specific information that this uh, buddha he gives to the 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 buddha to be the bodhisattva bodhi one who will enlighten satta uh, being so the enlightenment being the being who will be enlightened as a summer somebody and they they get these predictions then whenever they they meet another buddha later on and uh, buddha gotama he got 24 predictions because he met 24 buddhas before him uh, and so this is very but somebody has met 10000 Uh, Buddhas and they got, then got ten thousand predictions, but in between, at other lives where they are they are born, they are still working on their perfections. They cannot remember. They don't know that, that they are enlightenment being. Bodhisattvas often don't know, at least. In this universe, we are very, very lucky or fortunate because there has already been four Buddhas, and this is an, a, a special kind of universal cycle. Uh, the only one we know in buddhist history going many uh, 100,000 eons back that there will come one more called mitseya in 756 billion years there will come one more and he will arise in the indian city of benares and the city at that point will be called kitumattu the whole th- his whole life story has already been uh, foretold and is in the text uh, called the anagalavamsa the chronicle of the future the chronicle of the future anagata vamsa vamsa chronicle uh, anagata future so uh, yes i think this covers but they are exceedingly 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 rare so when they are here one should should meet them do one's utmost to be the last seven one was called vipassi sikki visabu kakusanta kunagamana kasappa and gotama gotama was the last one also called siddhatta siddhatta gotama siddhatta was his first name and gotama was his family name i hope this uh covers uh the questions send in your new questions and i'll take them uh, next sunday and i hope the recording was good but there was a little thing with the light uh, so when the light goes low then it cannot auto focus uh, so i also uh, will get some better light uh, so this not, it doesn't happen so the technical quality becomes better i apologize for that okay Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Worthy Honorable And perfectly self-enlightened Issa Bliss Buddha Thank you for your attention And have a nice day